Well, good morning, VT Online family. So glad that you are tuned in with us from wherever you may be today. Uh, if it's your first time watching with us, you are the VIP today. We're so thankful that you're with us. Again, I hope you'll text us, as Marshall mentioned earlier, mentioned earlier. And also, sometime later today, you can download our Connect card from our app and let us know any questions you might have about our church. Or also, uh, let us know any prayer requests that we could be praying for uh, for you. But again, those of you that are watching for the first time, you're the VIP. Uh, everyone else, why don't you send out those uh, hallelujah hands and those clap, hand clap emojis for our first time guests today. Now, those of you that are watching online, uh, we know that this past week uh, we received the, the first of what's probably going to be uh, many executive orders or uh, announcements from our governor, Greg Abbott, uh, as the state begins to reopen. And you may be thinking to yourself, well, what's going on with church? What's happening at BT? And I just want to share a few things with you right now. I want you to know, first off, that we are working diligently. Uh, we're committed to prayer uh, to operate uh, with the right blend of wisdom and faith as we move forward. Uh, every service since we've been in quarantine or stay at home, since we've been doing online church, I have closed after our blessing by saying that we will see you soon. And this is what I'll say. I, I don't know exactly at this point in time what that date is, but I know that it is soon. Uh, we are working towards that day. Uh, and as soon as we have all the specifics lined out, uh, we're going to be giving y'all an announcement. I would anticipate even this week we would be able to announce what our reopen process looks like here at BT. I do want to say this, though, uh, that as we're working towards that, as we're getting all of the campuses ready uh, to reopen and celebrate what God's going to do, and as we operate with wisdom and also respecting the recommendations of our state and local governments, we are working towards that. In fact, today is unique uh, for myself, and maybe even during this feed, you've heard something that you haven't heard in a few weeks. You've maybe heard some uh, hand claps or some amens. And so actually, it's nice for me today. I'm so thankful that you're watching uh, from wherever you are. Uh, but instead of just having the camera where my attention is going to be this morning, we do have some of our staff here in the room in McAllen uh, and some of our elders as well. And so I'm going to ask those of you that are in the room, you got to be loud because it's got to pick up in the camera or in my microphone technically, but make some noise for BT Online to know that we are soon <laughs> returning. <laughs> And so I do hope you're able to pick that up. Uh, we are working towards that, and I, I thank God for all that's happened uh, during these six weeks. And we know that it may be another week or two still, but, but we are working towards that, and we look forward to seeing everyone across the four locations and continuing our online campus as well. Speaking of God's work and His faithfulness, let me just share this with you. So far this year in 2020, 299 people have placed their faith in Jesus as Savior. They've trusted Him as Savior. And since we've gone online, this being the sixth week, so uh, in five weeks, uh, we have seen 113 people place their faith in Jesus, texting and letting us know uh, that decision. And so I'm just so thankful what God is doing. We know he's going to keep doing above and beyond all we could ever ask or think according to the power that works in us. And so those of you watching online and even those of you that are here in the room with me, why don't you grab your Bible and open up to Mark chapter 10 this morning. Mark chapter 10 is where we are going to be. Uh, right there at the end of the chapter, we're going to look at verses 46 through 52 as we continue our Questions from God series. This series, we've been looking at various questions that God asks of people in the Scriptures, and we believe at BT that these are questions worth answering ourselves. In fact, I believe that when we answer these questions, we position ourselves to fulfill the growth track we have at BT. When we answer these questions correctly, we work towards being people fully surrendered to Jesus. When we answer these questions correctly, we work towards bringing people to Jesus. And also when we answer these questions correctly, we work towards building people up in Christ as we are built up ourselves. So Mark chapter 10, verse 46 is where we're going to be. It's a, it's a pretty unique story about a blind, a blind man named Bartimaeus. And uh, if any of you watching online are expecting a son, I encourage you to pick Bartimaeus uh, for his name. We need to bring that name back this year, I think. Um, but no, blind Bartimaeus is what he's been known as. And here in the text, you'll hear the question. The question Jesus asks Bartimaeus is, what do you want me to to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? What a great question that is. And I believe today that Jesus still asks that question of us. I believe Jesus still asks, what do you want me to do for you? And in this story, what we're going to see, what we're really going to look at is what did Bartimaeus do to position himself to have the question asked of him? What did he do to put himself in position 
And what did he do when the question was asked of him? And, and what can we learn from this blind man? And so we're going to dive in. This is the text this morning. Again, Mark 10, Mark 10, starting in verse 46. It says this, they came to Jericho and as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples, that's Jesus, in a large crowd, uh, Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the road. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many warned him to keep quiet, but he was crying out all the more, have mercy on me, son of David. And Jesus stopped and said, call him. And so they called the blind man and said to him, have courage, get up, he's calling for you. He threw off his coat, jumped up, and came to Jesus, and then Jesus answered him, what do you want me to do for you? Rabbanai, the blind man said to him, I want to see. And Jesus said to him, go, your faith has saved you, and immediately he could see and began to follow Jesus on the road. Amen. What a powerful Story. What a what a great story that we see here. But in case you missed it, as I was reading, uh, it turns out that in this story, Bartimaeus actually has a problem. Right? I don't know if you picked up on that, but Bartimaeus has a problem. What's the problem? He's blind. Right? Uh, it says it right there at the end of the story that that as Jesus and the disciples and the crowd were leaving, there was a blind beggar. So he's not just blind; he's a beggar. But there's a blind beggar named Bartimaeus. He has a problem. That, that's a pretty big problem, if you ask me. You can read the Bible cover to cover. I encourage you to do that sometime. You can read the Bible cover to cover, and what you'll see is just about everyone we read about in Scripture had a problem. Everyone had problems. Here's a little secret, by the way. Don't tell anyone, um, but, but everyone watching online right now, you have problems, okay? Aren't you encouraged that you tuned in today? We all, we all I have, I've got problems. We all have problems. There, there may be school problems right now. There may be relational problems. There may be financial problems. There might be emotional problems. There might be spiritual problems. What made Bartimaeus unique is not the fact that he had problems, but it's what he, it's what he did with his problems. See, having problems didn't make Bartimaeus any different than probably anyone else in the crowd that day. Having problems doesn't separate Bartimaeus from you and I. It's not the fact that he had problems, it's what he did with the problems he had. Think about it for a second. What, what do so many people do today with their problems? Hey, here, here's a few examples. I think people today, uh, one of the things we, we do most of the time is we stress over our problems, right? These past six weeks, longer than that across the country, uh, these past several months, uh, lots of people have stressed over problems. You think about it, what happens when we stress over our problems? When we stress over our problems, we practice a bad infatuation, right? Think about infatuation. It's like an unhealthy attachment. And so when, when you've got financial, relational, emotional, all real problems, but when we, when we stress over them, all we're doing is we're practicing a really bad infatuation. Some people fixate on their problems. It's not just that they're, that, that, that they're stressed, but it's, it's a different level. They fixate. It's all they think about, which if you fixate, you will most likely stress over your problems. When we fixate on our problems, it's bad attention. Those of you that have trusted Jesus, here's the deal. When you fixate on your problems, you're ignoring the answer. When we receive Jesus, when we fixate on the problem, we ignore the answer that we have in Jesus. So some people, they fixate. Some people ignore him, right? That's pretty popular. Oh, this, I'm just going to, I'm just going to pretend it's not happening. But the problem with ignoring is that it just becomes a bad distraction. If you ignore problems in your marriage, sooner or later, you're going to have to deal with them. And you ignore problems uh, with your children. If you ignore problems at school, you ignore problems in your finances. You ignore problems in your spiritual life. Sooner or later, you'll have to deal with them. It's really just a bad distraction. The last thing I'll say is, uh, unfortunately, many of us, I'm guilty of this. Sometimes when it comes to my problems, I try to fix it. You may think, well, why is that wrong? I mean, we should be proactive. We should absolutely be proactive. But the truth is, a lot of us, a lot of you watching, when I say that you and I try to fix it, what, what, what do you do? We actually try to fix it without consulting the fixer, right? Uh, before we genuinely go to the Lord in prayer, after, usually after stressing, fixating, and ignoring, we then try to fix the problem. And when we try to fix the problem, it's bad application. It's not that God won't call us to be active. 
It's not that God won't give us steps to take. It's not that God won't give us direction to follow. But when we try to fix without his counsel, all we're doing is getting bad application. Based on this story of Bartimaeus, there is something different we can do. There's something else we can do. There's something we can do that makes a difference, and the something is actually a someone. Something interesting about Bartimaeus is that even though he doesn't have eyesight, it's very clear to me he has insight. See, he couldn't see with his eyes, but it didn't stop him because I love what the text says. It doesn't say that he saw Jesus because he was blind. Even though he didn't have eyesight, he had insight. It says when he what? When he heard, he used what he had. When he heard that it was Jesus, not just that he heard there was a crowd, when he heard that it was Jesus, meaning he had heard about Jesus. He had to have heard something about Jesus that would prompt him to run towards him. There's so many things in the story that, that I love. He, he runs towards Jesus, hearing that's who it is, doesn't even know where he's at. He's following the sounds. And then he cries out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And, and the crowds, maybe it's even disciples, but they're like, shh, be, be quiet, blind guy. We, we, he's got things to do. He's got people to see. He's very important. And, you know, sometimes in life, in our efforts to actually run to God, you may have people that try to slow you down. Now, you don't need to be praying about that. You need to get busy working on that. You, you don't need to be going to church. You, you don't need to be wasting time on that. You need, to, you need to get busy fixing your own problems. Or sometimes maybe it's even the inner voice that says you can't take that to God. It's not big enough for him. There's no such thing as a problem too small for God. When Bartimaeus ran to Jesus and the crowd tried to stop, tried to stop him, all he did was cry out all the more. And so then Jesus calls him to himself. And what what I believe we see in the text is that it's not just that Bartimaeus had heard about Jesus, he believed what he heard. See, that's, that's the, the secret here. And we're going to talk about this in a few minutes. But Jesus said it was Bartimaeus' faith, not just that gave him eyesight, but saved him. It wasn't just that he heard things, it's that he believed the right things. What he believed, listen to this, what he believed about Jesus was strong enough for him to take action. I think today... In the midst of a COVID-19 pandemic, I think even beyond that pandemic, though, I'm talking to those of us that have Jesus in our hearts that are active in the church. What would it look like in our church, in our church, in our communities? What would it look like if the people who know Jesus believe strongly enough in who he is that it caused them to take action? What, what, would, what would change in our homes, in our neighborhoods, in our workplaces, and in our schools? You know, what, 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 what action did Bartimaeus take? There's something really specific that I want to kind of camp out on today. When I look at this short story, what I see is there's, some, there's a very specific action that Bartimaeus took that I want us to follow. And this is what Bartimaeus did. I want you to write this down if you're taking notes. Bar Bartimaeus turned his problem into a prayer request. That's what he did. He had a problem, right? He was blind. It wasn't just that. He, he, he actually, he didn't even say you know, Jesus, son David, give me eyesight. I believe he was praying towards that end, but he said, have mercy on me. Bartimaeus took his problem and he turned it into a prayer request. All of the categories of problems that you and I have today, financial, some of those are real. People have had their hours cut. They've been demoted. They've been furloughed. Some have been laid off. Finances are real. There were financial issues for some before COVID ever happened. Financial problems are real. Emotional problems are real. Spiritual problems are real. School problems are real. You know, in these past six weeks, I think about the landscape of our community and what's happened. You know, there are parents that have never homeschooled before that have become homeschool teachers. Uh, I can attest to this. There are Blessed individuals called to that. My wife and I are not in that category. There are students that have never been homeschooled, and they're adjusting. There are couples that haven't been home together this much, and maybe that's God working on something. But all these problems, relational, school-related, financial, spiritual, all of these problems have a similar answer. They should be our prayer requests. When we turn our problem into a prayer request, we start seeing progress and we start moving forward. What happened when, Jesus, when Bartimaeus called out to Jesus? He's told to be quiet. He cries out all the more. And then Jesus calls him to himself. Jesus was headed somewhere. He was headed to Jerusalem. He's headed 
to Jerusalem for what would end up being, by the way, in chronology, what would end up being his final Passover. This would be the last time he makes this trip. Think about all the things that are going on. And Bartimaeus, the blind beggar, calls out, and Jesus stops and calls him to himself. What does that mean? It means Jesus was ready to meet Bartimaeus. Jesus was ready to stop for Bartimaeus, and beloved, he's ready to meet you too. In the story, it's powerful because Bartimaeus receives his sight. But more than that, Jesus said that his faith had saved him. Beloved, I can't tell you what turning your problem into a prayer request will result in specifically. I can't tell you that if you start taking that financial, relational, emotional, fill-in-the-blank problem to Jesus, what it's going to look like today. What I can promise you is that Jesus hears them, that God is actively involved in them. See, one of the things you have to understand about prayer, it's not, it's not that when we pray, we force God into action. It's that when we pray, we see God's action. Prayer changes the one that's praying. When we, call, when we cry out to God, we, we see what he's doing. We see the work. So those problems, all the categories that I've listed, we start seeing where God is working. Sometimes we pray and what happens is not what we pray for. Sometimes we pray for things very specifically. And, and, and in fact, what ends up happening may even be the opposite of what we're praying for. See, we have to understand this today. There's a truth that God's not a genie in a lamp. We don't rub the Bible and say a prayer so God is forced to do what we want. I, I refer to it as the cosmic vending machine. God is not this cosmic vending machine where we put money in and push the button, and God's forced to dispense the product we ask for. And I, I want to say this. When, when God doesn't respond or he doesn't move according to the way we're praying, it's not that he's disinvolved, disinterested, or distant. It's that he has a better plan. See, the truth is we would be in great danger if God was a genie in a lamp. I would be in so much trouble. I, I, I could think back to all of the requests that I've prayed for, and he answered differently. It's not that he doesn't answer. That, that's, that's an inaccurate statement. But there have been things I have prayed for and God answered differently and that's been beneficial for my soul because God sees things that I do not see. And so I'm thankful that I can't force his hand. I'm thankful that, that he's not at my beck and call, but that he operates according to his good and perfect will and that includes how his good and perfect will applies to my life. The most amazing part of this story with Bartimaeus is actually not that he received his sight. It's that God was gracious enough, that Jesus was gracious enough to stop and let him see him move. The, the, the miracle is that Jesus stopped for a sinner. And he stops for all sinners when he goes to Calvary and he extends salvation to all those who would call upon his name. And so what happens in this story is Bartimaeus gets his sight. God, by the way, still does those things. Let's not start to believe that God doesn't operate in the miraculous. That's why I've been praying. You're like, oh, well, he's not listening. No, he's doing something. I've been praying every day since this became reality that God would deliver us from this evil. And you know what? I'm thankful. Hear me. I'm not thankful for what COVID-19 has caused. I'm not thankful that uh, for uh, six, seven weeks, whatever it is, I haven't been with my church family. In my entire life, in 41 years, I've never not been gathered this long. And I haven't even been a believer, I haven't been a believer my whole life, but I've been in church my whole life. And so I want, I want to be clear. I don't want to be misunderstood. I'm not thankful for the, for the harm that's come, for those that have lost their job, but I am thankful that in God's sovereignty, even in the midst of trouble, he has done something. And it's, it's bigger than BT, by the way. I talk to friends across the state and the country, but at BT Church, he has called 113 people to salvation. That through this trouble, that through this, he has called people Back in, in, a, in a few weeks, whenever it's going to be, we're going to gather together. But all the BT family, I want, it's hard to do. We try to change our language. Don't, don't talk about how you're excited for when things go back to normal. I don't want things to ever be what they were. I want God to do above and beyond all I can ask or think. I don't think it's going to be normal. In fact, I think if what, all we long for is that our church specifically would go back to what it was, we're going to miss what God wants to do. I think this is the next step in revival. I think sight is going to be given to the community of South Texas. I don't want normal. Things are going to change. It's going to be different. It's going to be hard. It's going to be difficult. We don't really like change, but that, th this, this isn't an interruption. 
what we're experiencing, right? An interruption. This is, this, is a, this is a disruption. This has been a disruption for the church to stop and to seek the face of God and say, what are you wanting us to do? What are, what are you wanting from us? How do we need to transition to continue to take the gospel out, to see disciples made, homes transformed, and the community of South Texas, which would then change the world? How, how do we need to respond and I think where it starts, looking at the story of Bartimaeus, is it starts with the power of prayer. Bartimaeus cried out in prayer to Jesus. I think we can go throughout the scriptures. I don't have time, but I'll give you a few verses about the power of prayer. Matthew chapter 7, verse 7, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, pray constantly. 1 Peter 5, 7, in this larger passage, Peter says, casting or cast all your cares on him because he cares about you. Philippians 4, 6, don't worry about anything, but in everything through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Here's the deal, beloved. You miss 100% of the blessings you don't pray for. Let that sink in. That's not prosperity. That's Bible. You miss 100% of the blessings that you do not pray for. You miss 100% of the opportunities to make much of Jesus that you don't pray for. I've been aware of that. As 113 people have given their life to Jesus, I've thought to myself, how many people am I not telling about Jesus? Not because I'm not willing to, not because I don't have the urge to, but because I'm not praying for those people. I will miss 100% of the opportunities to tell people about Jesus that I don't pray about. You will miss 100% of the opportunities to be faithful in obedience that, uh, when it comes to steps you don't pray about. You're not tithing. You're not trusting the Lord with, with those resources. We at BT believe that when you do that, you unlock the blessings of God. But your next step may be to pray about that step. Now, hear me. That prayer needs to become action. But maybe what's holding you back is there's a trust issue, something in your relationship. Maybe it's baptism. We'll talk about that at the close of the service. But we will miss 100% of the steps of obedience that you don't pray about. You know, sometimes we use prayer as an excuse not to act. I recognize that. But sometimes we stay in a holding pattern and we stay plateaued because the steps we need to take, we actually have not yet prayed about. And so here in this story, Bartimaeus has a problem. He turns the problem into a prayer request. He cries out to Jesus. His prayer was effective. And in light of this story, in light of this situation, I think there are four characteristics of prayer, of effective prayer that we can see from the blind man. And so I want to go ahead and jump into it. I want you to write these four things down. And I think this is critical, by the way, for our reopening. As we move forward and continue to anticipate what God's going to do, here's the first thing that I see from the life of Bartimaeus. Effective prayer requires praying in Jesus' name. Seems pretty simple. But effective prayer requires praying in Jesus' name. Again, in verse 47, when he heard that it, when he, um, I'm sorry, when he heard that it was uh, Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. He's very specific what he does. He cries out to Jesus. He, he, you know, today uh, we could say this. He doesn't call out to Muhammad. He doesn't call out uh, uh, to just the generic little G God. He doesn't cry out to Mary or saints. He calls out on the name of Jesus. Effective prayer requires praying in Jesus's name. In fact, all throughout the Bible, uh, through the New Testament, Jesus teaches that when we pray, we should pray to God the Father in Jesus' name. If we remember the, the Lord's Prayer or the model prayer, Jesus taught his disciples to pray our Father in heaven, right? So we address the fact that we are praying to God in heaven. In John 14, 13, Jesus said, whatever you ask, what? In my name. Whatever you ask in my name, I will do it so that my Father may be glorified in the Son. Now, sometimes, some of you have already been thinking this. I read Matthew 7, 7, ask will be given to you. I read, you know, John 14, 13, whatever you uh, ask in my name. You're like, I've been asking for lots of things in Jesus' name. No, you've been asking for things in your name, and you've just been abusing the name of Jesus. There's a difference. Because Jesus is very clear. He says, he says, Whatever you ask in my name, I will do it so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Sometimes we ask for things, and we may put the moniker, we may put the, the closing line of in Jesus' name. But what we're asking for isn't for God's glory, it's for our glory. God, you got to help me. you got to change this situation. It's not that God can't, that he doesn't want to, that he's not involved, that he doesn't love, that he doesn't provide peace. But, but we are praying that we would be glorified, and we're praying for our glorification in Jesus' name. 
What does it mean to pray in the, in, in the name of Jesus? What did Jesus say in John 14, 6? He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. See, here's a reality that most of us are aware of. Our sin separates us from God, right? And the only way to come to God is through Jesus. And so when we come to God in prayer, we do so by the power and the blood of Jesus in our lives. When our sins are forgiven by placing our faith, by trusting Jesus as Savior, when we believe in our heart and confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, then we are made right with God, and we are made right with God by the power of Jesus. So it's in Jesus' name that we indeed receive salvation. When we pray in Jesus' name, and I know that sometimes, well, is it legalistic? I don't close that way. I'm just going to I'm just going to say this. I, I, I'm a, I push back against legalism, but if you don't pray in Jesus' name, uh, it's, oh, God doesn't hear it. I'm just going to say, just, just start practicing it. Just, just, just start practicing it because what I believe is that when we, when we pray in Jesus' name, and there's no formula or model, but praying in his name recognizes that I, in fact, need his name over my life. That's what's so important. When I, whether you're closing a prayer, it doesn't have to be the closing, but, but when you're praying in Jesus' name, it's actually an acknowledgement that I need his name over my life. It's his banner, right, that's over me. I need that truth applied to my life. You think about it. Let me, let me just say this before I go to the next point. Uh, you know, as the state begins to reopen, uh, movie theaters will be open at some point in time. I, you know, they, they could have opened this weekend, but uh, my understanding is maybe the the cost and return isn't quite there. But at some point in time, the next weeks and months, movies will begin to open, uh, concerts, sporting events. But if you're going to go to a movie, my wife and I, our kids, we love going to the movie theater. But the funny thing is we can show up to the movie theater, and if I don't pull out my phone with a little QR code or pull out the physical ticket, I'm not getting into the movie, right? Because you have to have a ticket to get to the movie. Well, just think about it this way. Jesus is the ticket to get to the Father. There, there, is a, there is an admission requirement. Everyone doesn't get on the bus to heaven just somehow in the end. Well, God's, if God's good, he wants us all to go. He does want us all to go. But sin is a real problem. And sin is dealt with by the work of Jesus. And the work of Jesus is applied to our lives when we believe in our heart and confess with our mouth. And so just think of it this way, that Jesus is the ticket to the Father. And so I want to re remember that every time I pray, that it's in Jesus' name that I'm even able to offer these prayers. Bartimaeus shows us who when he cries out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me, that effective prayer is prayed in the name of Jesus. Here's the second thing. Effective prayer requires humility. Effective prayer requires humility. What, what did Bartimaeus say? He said, have mercy on me. He's not coming from, from some standpoint, but, you know, I, I deserve to see. I've lived my entire life without eyesight. Everyone else has eyesight that I know this isn't fair. Fix this. You owe me. No, no. He says, have mercy on me. It, to me, it communicates that Bartimaeus recognized that even what he was praying for, he had some sense of identity or, or, or of aware, awareness that he didn't deserve it. Now, during this time, a common belief was that when someone had an ailment or disability like blindness, uh, that it was a result of their sin, and if they were born that way, it was a result of their parents' sin. I don't have time to get into all that, but there's, there's nothing in the text, at least, that would cause us to believe uh, that Bartimaeus is blind due to his sin or his parents' sin. And that's not the point here. There, 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 while there's nothing in the text that would cause us to believe that, uh, the, the reality is, is that he called out to Jesus, have mercy on me, because it doesn't matter, uh, you know, trying to analyze was his sin or his parents' sin. The truth is Bartimaeus was a sinner, right? All of us are sinners. Bartimaeus was a sinner. He longed for eyesight, but he needed the faith that would provide salvation. He needed Jesus not just to heal him, but to save him. The truth is, when we call upon Jesus to save us, when we call upon Jesus to help us, when we, when we call upon Jesus and pray in his name, it's an admission that we need help. Prayer should be done in humility. You know, I think sometimes those of us that have been believers for a long time, I know like no one wants to think this, but sometimes when the longer we've trusted Jesus, unfortunately, sometimes the more we tend to think that we at least partially earned our salvation. I mean, of course, I need Jesus to die on the cross, but I feel like the longer we're in church and the more we're saved and, and the, well, the longer we're in church and the longer we're saved and the longer we, we don't pray effective prayer sometimes when, when it becomes all about us, we maybe 
inadvertently start to believe that somehow we at least did 1% of the work to receive our salvation, or we didn't need that much of Jesus' blood applied to our life. The problem with that thinking is that when you have a problem, right, say, well, I go to church and I tithe and I do all, the, and then sometimes when life happens and you have a diagnosis, you lose that job, you can't make the ends meet, the loved one passes away, you have the dark night of the soul. Sometimes when we start thinking that we've been good enough to receive things, and then when life happens, if we're not careful, we think that somehow God failed us, that we deserve better than the hand that we have been dealt. And I've heard people say this, I just wish God would be fair towards me. Beloved, you should never pray that God would be fair towards you. You should never pray that way. Because if God was fair towards us, none of us would have a chance. Jesus' grace applied to my life is not fair. Well, what do you mean? It cost Jesus his life. The innocent, blameless, all-powerful Son of God gave himself up so that I could call upon his name and be saved. When I come to him, I need to remove the arrogance. Now, look, God can handle our frustrations, okay? Uh, he, he, can, he can handle our questions. But let's just make sure that in the midst of those struggles, we understand who we are and who he is. Humility is key to effective prayer because it actually recognizes that God is God and I am not. Praying with hum humility reminds me when God doesn't move according to my prayers. When God acts not in the way that I'm praying, but in a different way, it reminds me, humility reminds me that I'm not in charge, that my requests are not commands, and that when God operates differently than what I'm praying, it's actually good. Beloved, when God, when, when God answers your prayer differently than how you have been praying, I'm not saying it's not difficult, but that is the moment to start shifting your prayers and pray that God would give you the vision, the sight, to see what he's doing. Because what he is doing is good and perfect. What he is doing is gracious and loving. Yeah. But it's humility that allows us to pray that way. So effective prayer requires humility. Here's the third thing. Effective prayer requires specificity. That's a hard word to say. Specificity. But what happens in the text? After getting through the crowd, crying out, Jesus stops, calls him to himself. I love what it says. It says they, they, they told him not to be fearful. And so what that means is that somehow Bartimaeus was, exp was expressing concern, right? Now that Jesus actually stopped, he's like, whoa, <laughs> don't know if I anticipated this one. But they said, no, you c come forward. And when he gets there, Jesus says, There's, here's the question from God. What do you want me to do for you? And he, he, it may not seem specific, but it's very specific. He says, have mercy on me. What, what do you want? I, I want you to have mercy on me. I'm not, I'm not even saying I'm deserving to be in your presence and to be crying out, but I've, I've heard what you've done. I've heard who you are. And I'm asking you to have mercy on me. Now, it can seem like an odd question, right? That Jesus asked this in verse 51, and some of this is above my understanding, because this is what I know. Jesus knew what he needed. He knew he was blind. He, he, he knew what the answer was going to be. I mean, Jesus can read minds if you want to use that language, of course. He could have just healed Bartimaeus. When Bartimaeus said, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me, he didn't have to stop him. He's going to Jerusalem. He could have just you know, winked, blinked. How is that different, by the way? I don't Anyways, um, he, he, could, he could have just thought it, clapped, jumped. In any way he wanted to, he could have healed him without even addressing him. All of these things are realities, but instead he calls him to himself. And he says, he says, what do you want me to do for you? What, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said, I, I want to see. I want to see. He cries out, have mercy on me. And then when he says, what do you want me to do for you? He says, I want to see. Beloved, I don't understand the tension here because I know that God knows all things and he's not waiting for us to inform him. But I believe that what we're learning is that effective prayer requires this specific nature of our requests. What I believe is that when we get specific, Bartimaeus knew he was blind. Jesus knew he was blind. But I think there's something in praying that way with specifics that recognizes that Jesus can do something about it. It says, I, I want 
to see. I believe to pray effectively is to pray specifically. Again, we've mentioned this verse a lot, but back in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, we're told by the Apostle Paul, don't worry about anything. But in everything, through prayer and petition, or some versions say supplication, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Present your requests to God. Beloved, what are the things that God knows you need, and you, you know you need, but for whatever reason you have not yet told him you need them? I think when we start crying out for God to move in very specific ways, it opens our eyes to see what he's doing. Sometimes we pray for things specifically, and he specifically doesn't do those things. But it opens our eyes to see what's happening. It opens our eyes and our hearts to change our prayers. It lets us in on the movement of God. Effective prayer requires specificity. But here's the last thing. I think the most powerful part of the story, I believe effective prayer requires faith. Again, going back to the story, he cries out, have mercy on me, right? Son of Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. What do you want me to do for you? I, I want to see. In verse 52, Jesus said to him, go, your faith has saved you, has saved you. And immediately he could see. And what did he do? He began to follow Jesus on the road. Jesus said, your faith has saved you. I think some people today are confused about faith. Faith is not believing that God will give you exactly what you ask for. Faith is not, again, turning God into a cosmic vending machine. No, faith, faith is more than that. It's not believing that God does exactly what I ask of him. It, it, it's that, that God's going to act according to his ways and his purposes. Faith is believing that, that God is listening. It's believing that he will answer according to his good and perfect will. In fact, you have to have faith to pray. You have to have faith to pray, to let go of, of the desire, to let go of the expectation that God has to do exactly what you're asking him to do. It actually requires faith to pray that God would respond and move and act according to his good and perfect will. I think the reason so many believers don't pray or pray very little is because they don't believe it's worth their time. So many times we're not specific in our prayers. We don't even offer up our prayers because we believe that somehow along the way we've bought, the, we, we've bought into this lie that it's not actually worth our time. But I think the underlying issue is that many times the believer doesn't have the faith to pray. I love what happens in the story. I'm going to go back to it one more time. That when they called him, when they called Bartimaeus to Jesus, it says he threw off his coat jumped up and came to Jesus. Now, I'm just, I don't want to get lost in the weeds. So he has this outer covering, this garment. It says he threw off his coat. Now, the earlier part of the text says that there was a crowd, okay? Now, I don't know all the details here. There's some type of crowd. He's calling out. He's got to get loud because they're telling him to be quiet. Jesus stops, says, bring him to me. Call, call him over here. And so they said, hey, Jesus is calling you. The blind guy gets up and throws off his coat in the midst of a crowd. That's not a great move for a blind guy. Just saying. How's he going to get back to the coat? I don't want to read in. I don't want to supply anything that's not there. But there is something in me that says Bartimaeus already responded with some faith that Jesus, that, that he was going to be able to find the coat because he was going back with eyesight. Amen. And Jesus says, your faith has saved you. See, it's not, let me say it again, it's not believing that God has to do what I'm asking him to do. It's believing that God is going to do something. It's letting go of putting God in some box because so many times what we want him to do is not big enough compared to what he's going to do. And so how, how is praying actually a faith-based activity? It's when we believe that God is listening that he's going to move. It's in that strength that we pray. Uh, Hebrews eleven six says, Now without faith it is impossible to please God, since the one who draws near to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. You have to believe, beloved, the words of James 5, 16. The prayer of a righteous person is very powerful in its effect. You have to believe the words of James 4, 8. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. You have to have faith in the words of Jeremiah 29, 13, you will seek me and find me when you search for me with 
all of your heart. What does that mean? Not just asking God to fill some temporary need and to be a genie in a bottle, but to seek him with all of your heart. You have to believe the words, beloved, of 2 Chronicles 7, 14. And my people who bear my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their evil ways. I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and heal their land. What do you do with your problems, beloved? What do you do with your struggles? You turn the problems into prayer requests, and then you sit back and you watch God move. And when he doesn't move according to the way you're praying, then you start praying that he'll show you what he's up to. He doesn't answer according to your prayers, and I could go on and on and give you examples of all the ways that I have prayed certain ways, and God has moved in different ways. What I can't do is tell you how when God moved differently than I was praying, that somehow I was worse off because of it. And so what do we do? How can we see like Bartimaeus did? How, can, how do we answer when Jesus asks, what do you want me to do? We'll begin by understanding the first thing we need is the mercy of God applied to our lives so that we can then pray specifically for what we are asking Jesus to do. And so let me share a few things as we wrap up this morning. First off, if you're struggling with prayer. Sometimes we just have to be honest, right? Sometimes, even though we've been in church a long time or we're brand new to the faith and the excitement's worn off, we have to acknowledge what's going on. If you're struggling with praying for whatever reason, I'm going to encourage you to to commit to that this week. Now, let let me share with you something that's going to sound super not spiritual, but I think it's super beneficial. The truth is when we struggle with praying, and I'm not just talking about before a meal, and that's valuable, not just at bed, that's bedtime, that's valuable. But what are you praying in those times and in between? If you're struggling with an effective prayer life, let me just give you four things to consider. Okay, I want you to write this down. This could be your next step. If you're struggling with your prayer time, I want you to do that. I want you to start by scheduling it. Like, oh, no, prayer is supposed to be spontaneous. It can be spontaneous, but why does it have to be? In fact, if you're not praying regularly and you're waiting for the spontaneous moment, you're going to miss it. (laughs) And so say, I'm going to pray every morning. I'm going to get out of bed, and maybe you need to get the coffee. That, it's not sinful, like, oh, first thing in the morning. Well, if you don't think clear, get some coffee, and then pray when you're thinking clear. <laughs> maybe, maybe it's in the evening. I'm not, I don't know what it looks like. The funny, you know, the funny thing is we try to make it more spelled out than the Bible does, okay? What I'm saying is, is, is just schedule it and organize it. Where's the room for the Holy Spirit? Let's not forget that the Spirit of God works in, inside of order all throughout Scripture. What, what do you mean organize it? Look, sometimes God just impresses things upon you, and you just pray in the moment, of course. But what I found in my life is that my, life is, my, my prayer life is rich and vibrant and effective when I'm actually putting some thought into it. This is just me. And so schedule it and organize it, but let me go to the next two, balance it and write it. Some of our prayer lives are skewed, and I've said this many times, because all you're doing is telling God what you want from him. There's no adoration. There's no thankfulness for what he's already done. Many times we will not see what God is doing. We won't see the above and beyond because we're so fixated on this little thing that God wants to do bigger than. We're we're so fixated on the payoff, and it's not that God doesn't bring the payoff, beloved. There is always the payoff, but between his promise and the payoff, there's this process. And in that process, there's dozens of little prayers. And someone, you you need to balance your prayer. And and it's not that you don't take your request. I would never say that. Of course you pray with with specificity. But in that, you just thank God for what he's already done. You thank God for how he's moving. You just acknowledge that he is, in fact, God. You balance it. Write it. Write it and organize it. What what are you saying? I I pray for all of my family members, right? And, you know, I, I don't confess to be this amazing prayer warrior, but I pray for my family members, I pray for the the staff at this church and their families, and I pray for our elders. I have friends throughout the years that God has just put on my heart. And this may not sound spiritual, but I've got this little system, and every day I pray for a group of people. You know why? I'm not smart enough to remember it. And all these years, I still get out a little notebook. I look at the day. The funny thing, I can add to it, right? And it's not that I have plenty of prayers where I don't have the journal out. I have plenty, plenty of prayers where God puts it upon my heart. But I believe if you are lacking a healthy prayer life, just try it this week. Schedule a prayer time. Say, this is when you're going to do it. 
organize. What are you going to pray about? Well, I don't know what to pray for. Pray for the reopening of the state of Texas. Pray for the reopening of BT Church. Pray for the salvation of those that are lost. Pray for your marriage. Pray, 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 pray for blessings in your singleness. Pray for kids. Pray for parents. Pray for finances. Pray that God will give you a heart for the lost. Just start writing names down. How do you need, you, you've lost your job. Pray with specificity that God would return that job, that he would do above and beyond. You'd have an even better job. But I believe that when the people of BT Church truly live as people of prayer, we're just going to see unthinkable things happen. And so I just encourage you to just to try it. Schedule it, organize it, balance, and write it. And let me just say this before I move on. i got to hurry up. But the other beauty about this system is you go back and you see the things you've prayed for and you see what God has done. You know, I, I use this illustration all the time, and it's just one of the most powerful moments in my life. I think back to all the prayers I prayed. Uh, my wife and I prayed with our youngest son, Luke, and I don't have time to get into that whole story, but I prayed for so many things, and I wanted God to do something very specific. And he didn't do what I prayed for. He did better than what I prayed for. And there's still times I pick up October and September and August and November of 2012, and I look at what I was praying for. Got this appointment today, God. I'm praying that the scans would be clear. Boom, not clear. There's so many situations, you just go back and you say, this is what I was praying for, but this is what he did. This is, this is what, he, what he did. You know, I, I've prayed every day. God delivers from evil. And, you know, we're still doing online church, and I don't know exactly what the end date is. I'm not confessing to have it all figured out, but I wonder what would have happened if this would have been a one-week interruption instead of a disruption. Some of you watching right now, you needed this disruption for you to see your need for God. Some of you needed this disruption to, to, to come back to God. Let's pray big prayers and let's see God move. Some, some of you, though, I need to hurry up. Some of you, you need to act on what you know. What does it say? It says, Bartimaeus heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth. And what he, what he knew, based on what he had heard, pushed him into action. So you, you, you just need to act on what you know. You're in a relationship. You know you need to end. I don't know how to say it. You're in a relationship that you know needs some counseling. Some in a few weeks, and as the summer goes on and we begin to step back into full services, you've been attending BT for quite some time. You have never served this church. You know you need to serve. You need to find a place to to plug in, join our dream team of volunteers. Some of you need to tame the tongue, right? You need to quit saying in your little group, you're in, you've been in church your entire life, and you know it's gossip, and you know it's slander, and you know that it is not sowing unity but seeds of discord. You need to quit saying, well, that's just who I am. Well, be who Jesus died to make you. Amen. You need to tame the tongue. You need, you need to commit to the tithe. You're just robbing God again and again. And I hope you never hear from us when we talk about it that we're in desperate need. Now, there may be a day that, that we are, but irregardless, if we're in desperate need or we're in plenty as a church, it's not a, actually about the church's bottom line. It's not about those things. It's about our heart's need for God and the dependence that is practiced when we say, God, it's all yours anyways. Thank you for the 90% you're letting me keep. And maybe someone you need to be obedient through baptism. For whatever reason, you've placed your faith in Jesus, but days, weeks, months, years have gone on, and there's various realities, but you just need to take the step of obedience. We've had several people, actually, that have texted in over the last six weeks. And I don't have all the details, but I want you to know that we're trying to figure out how we're going to do that, and we've got some exciting things planned to celebrate these baptisms. Maybe you need to be a part of that. In fact, I just want to say this. If you've never been baptized, you've, you've placed your faith in Jesus, you have salvation, but you've never been obedient with baptism after the moment. So I call it believer's baptism. You've been baptized as a believer. I want you to text this phone number today. It's 956-238-3733. I want you to text that number. Include your first and last name and just type the word baptism. Someone's going to respond to you today. And here in the next few weeks, we're going to be contacting you about how we want to move forward with celebrating your baptism. But take that next step. Here's the last thing. I think that there's someone watching right now. 
And Jesus is saying, what do you want me to do for you? And don't forget the order of the story. Yes, Bartimaeus did say, I want to see. But that was after his opening line of have mercy on me. I believe if, if he doesn't open with have mercy on me, you never get to I want to see. I think there's someone watching and you know you need Jesus to save you. You've been around church or maybe you've never been around church. Today's the first time. You don't know what's different about Jesus or Muhammad or, uh, you know, any other beliefs. You, know, you, don't, you don't know, but you know that there's this longing inside you. You know that something's wrong. You know that you need an answer. Jesus is the answer. And he's actually asking, what do you want me to do for you? And the question is, Jesus, I want, the answer is, Jesus, I want you to save me. If you've never placed your faith in Jesus as Savior, if you've never had that moment where you've crossed that line, I'm going to ask you wherever you are right now to bow your head and close your eyes. And for wherever you're watching, I want you to pray this prayer with me right now. Dear God, I know that I'm a sinner. And I know there's nothing I can do about it. But God, I believe that you sent your son Jesus to die for me and to do something about it. And Jesus, I believe that you were obedient, that you died for my sins, and that you rose again in victory. And so, Jesus, I'm asking you to save me. Thank you for loving me. It's in your name. Amen. I want you to know if you prayed that prayer wherever you are right now, you've not just prayed it, but if you believed it in your heart, the Bible says you believe in your heart and confess your mouth to Jesus Christ as Lord, you will be saved. If you believed what you've just said, then everything has changed. Everything's changed. Your eternity's been, re re been rewritten, and we believe at BT that every story should be celebrated. And so if you prayed to trust Jesus, I'm going to ask you to text that phone number. Again, 956-238-3733. I want you to text that phone number. Let us know what just happened. First and last name and the word salvation. We're going to respond to you today, and then later this week, someone's going to contact you. We have some books that we want to send out. We've got a little book we want, to, we want to send you in the mail to help you get started in this new relationship. But we just want to celebrate with you that Jesus has saved you. Those of you that said that prayer, I want you to know there's a celebration in heaven right now because your life has been transformed. For everyone that watched today, I'm so glad you tuned in. Continue to follow us on social media as we get ready to make some announcements and know that we're working diligently to be ready for that day that we come back together. Not when we go back to normal, because we don't ever want to be the same. But when we experience what God wants to do in this new season. Thank you so much for watching. Please tune in next week. And today as we wrap up our time together, we wrap up our time believing that God is not done. That he's going to continue to do above and beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. So would you help me declare this from wherever you are. Ephesians chapter 3 verses 20 and 21. Help me out. Here we go. And now to our Father who is able to do above and beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. And as we close out the service, I pray this blessing over you. I pray the Lord will bless you and keep you. I pray that make his face shine upon you and that be gracious to you. I pray he reminds you of his nearness, of his friendship as his countenance covers you. And I pray this week, as you live a life of effective prayer, that our great God would keep you with his perfect peace. BT family, you're loved. And we'll see you soon.